I'd like to invite UN Goodwill Ambassador Jaha Dukure to say a few words. We all met her earlier, and we all aspire to be like her when we grow up, right? <laughs> Jaha is a women's rights activist from the Gambia and a survivor of FGM. She's the founder and executive director of Safe Hands for Girls, an organization working to end FGM. Please join me in welcoming Jaha. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to thank Commissioner Mimika for having us. And um, I would personally like to thank two of my heroes, um, Ms. Amina Mohammed and Mama Funzile. You have done so much to make sure that women like me get this far. I was born in the Gambia in 1989. I'm 28 years old. And I went through female genital mutilation when I was one week old. At the age of 15, I was forced to get married. And then I remarried at the age of 17. So before turning 18, I had already been married twice. I lost my mother just three months before I got married. And globally, there are more than 750 women who are living with the consequences of child marriage. And more than 200 million women from more than 30 countries are living with the consequences of female genital mutilation. These are not just human rights issues, and these are not just women's issues. These are gruesome violations of their rights. When you force a young girl to get married at such an early age, you've subjected her to someone, you've given someone the right to rape her every single day. And a lot of times when we think about child marriage, we don't think about it that way. I remember when I first started talking about um, FGM, this was right after I gave birth to my daughter Khadija. I knew that I couldn't live in a world where my daughter would go through the same things that I went through. For years, I started advocating against FGM, but I couldn't talk about child marriage. And to this day, it's very, very hard for me to talk about child marriage. Because every time I hear of a story of a girl going through child marriage, it takes me back to where I was. And in my office, both in the Gambia and in the US, Whenever a case of child marriage comes up, they'll see how I withdraw from everyone. And it's very, very difficult for me to talk about it. I don't see any violation of human rights more than child marriage and female genital mutilation. In our communities, the first bad thing that happens to a girl when she's born is FGM. And we use FGM to prepare her for marriage. Female genital mutilation doesn't benefit women in any shape or form. We do it simply for the benefit of men. And it's time as a global community, this is not an African issue. It's a global issue. And it's time that we take these practices seriously. And that is why I'm very, very happy that the European Union has given 500 million towards ending violence against women. And most, some of that will go towards ending vow in Africa. And the focus of the Spotlight Initiative in Africa will be ending harmful traditional practices, which includes both FGM and child marriage. And to me, working with UN Women as their first regional goodwill ambassador for Africa, it's an opportunity for us to mobilize young people so that they can be part of this conversation. I think one of the reasons why I'm very, very happy to stand in front of you is because growing up, after losing my mother, it was very lonely and very challenging. A lot of times, I've accomplished a lot. Like for instance, when I was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize, the first person I wanted to talk to this about was my mother, but she wasn't there. And then I came to New York and Mama Funzile was more excited about my Nobel Peace Prize nomination than I was. And ever since then, she's been going around the world telling everyone about me and talking about me. I don't feel motherless anymore as a result of that because I have women like you women like Amina Mohammed and people like Dr. Isidou Toure who have paved the way for us to do this work on FGM. She started talking about FGM in the Gambia when it was very unfashionable and no one was doing it. And because of her, we saw women like her, we started doing it. And today she's the Minister of Trade in our country. And one of the first females in our country that ran for political office. So I think we commend you for that. You've paved so many doors for us and you continue to break glass ceilings for us. So I want to thank the European Commission for the investment that you have made. And I urge other donors to also make the same investment. 
I urge the European Commission to continue pushing the agenda for women and girls. Ending FGM is possible in our generation. It's no longer a dream. And it's happening because women like me, who know what it feels like to end these practices, are at the forefront of the campaign. This is not a career for us. This is our life. It's about our daughters. It's about our mothers. It's about our sisters. But we can't do it alone. We need your support and we need sustainability in order for us to accomplish that. UN Women, the United Nations, as well as other partner organizations like UNFPA and UNICEF are all doing a tremendous job. But they can only continue to do that with your sustained resources. So we thank you and we ask you to do more. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you, Jaha, for your important testimony and the work that you do to end harmful practices across the globe. I'd like to invite a panel now of distinguished experts to explore the Spotlight Initiative. As they join me on stage, please, um, I would be happy to introduce them. Uh, Fumzile Lambao Nguka, the Under Secretary General and Executive Director of UN Women. <clears throat> Hakima Abbas, the Co Executive Director of the Association for Women's Rights in Development. And Abhijit Das, the Global Co Chair of the Men Engage Alliance and Director of the Center for Health and Social Justice in New Delhi. Welcome. I'd like to start a very brief conversation by asking Fumzile, how do we ensure that those who have been historically excluded still continue to remain in the forefront when it comes to ending violence against women and girls? How do we do it? Well, I think... Uh I first also want to start by thanking the European Union for this uh, initiative. In particular, I thank Commissioner Mimika for believing in this course and living it. Thank you so much for your support. Um, Jaha has just showed us what it is like to be included, to be empowered, to be supported, so that when she says me too to the other girls, she is actually there to actively support them. By being an ambassador, having a platform for her to speak, she is able to speak more convincingly than we could ever do, all of us, because her own life is a testimony. So creating platforms, providing resources, engaging, young and old people to be the spokesperson about their own reality is probably one of the biggest investments that we can make about this issue. And what would you say is the biggest intervention a country can make, the one, the one main intervention a country can make when it comes to violence against women? A combination adults? of passing the laws so that it is illegal, that women have recourse, but also accompanying that with addressing the norms the stereotypes at a community level that sustain the practice. Because passing the law alone does not help if we do not address the actual stereotype that sustain the practice. So you need your members of parliament to pass the law just as you need your traditional leaders right at a community level also to be at the forefront of fighting against the, the harmful practices. And Hakima, women and girls themselves are speaking out loudly against violence and harass harassment and abuse, as, as we're all, we all know and are hearing. Like take a hashtag Me Too, uh, for example. Do you feel as though this is a, a global phenomenon? Do you feel like the voices of, of, of all women, um, even women that are marginalized, are being included in these large social movements? That's a great question. And I think when we look at Me Too, it's important to remember that it was, was started by the most marginalized. And it started many years ago. And it, it's not a phenomenon that started when the hashtag trended. Um, Me Too started in 2006, and it was begun by an African-American woman in the US named Tarana Burke. And the, the purpose of Me Too was to give voice to young, impoverished, um, largely women of color, survivors of sexual violence, and to give them right. a platform to talk to each other and to heal from those violences. Um, so 
it's important to, to recognize that it didn't start with the hashtag and builds on the multiple ways in which feminist women human rights defenders have been challenging the systems that enable and create and perpetrate this violence. And I know you were asking, kind of, what is what are the things that we can do at the national level? And one of the things we can do is support the women human rights defenders who are fighting to end violence against women and girls. And do, do you think there's some kind of a backlash to the Me Too type movements and the others? Is there like an, a fatigue? Uh, how do people remain energized and active? That's a great question. And, and I just want to say about, because I think Angelique Kijo said it a little bit when she was talking about the bottom up. Um, it's been shown, there is evidence to show that women human rights defenders and feminist movements are the ones to end violence against women. I don't know if anyone here has read a study by um, two academics called Hutton and Weldon. Um, the paper's called The Civic Origins of Progressive Policy Change. And I, I mention that because it's a global study of um, 70 countries over um, the years from 1975 to 2005. And what they found was that the single critical factor in ending violence against women and girls was the active mobilization of autonomous feminist and women's rights movements in the world. I think we all know that anecdotally, but it's really important to be able to say that there's evidence to prove that. Um, Abhijit, let me ask you about men and boys. Um, how, how, how do we harness men and boys more effectively than we already are uh, into this conversation that translates beyond the rhetoric and into practicality? I think uh, we haven't really started engaging with men and boys at the personal level because what is happening today is that we are getting men and boys to endorse an approach to gender equality. This endorsing role is still a paternalistic role and does not scratch patriarchy. Finally, if we have to aim towards gender equality and eliminating violence against women, I'm making a distinction between the two, we have to deal with patriarchy. And to deal with patriarchy, men cannot stay aside and say, women, you take the lead. Men have to give the space. And patriarchy means men have assumed a lot of privilege. Men will have to become conscious of those privileges at their personal level and work on changing the relationships bottom up, family forward. And until this happens, we are not going to see either an end to uh, you know, gender inequality or violence against women. And the way men are engaged today, I apologize, I don't think at a policy level men are really engaged. They're still standing so back, they're watching women Please take the lead, so, take the lead. We are the endorsers, we'll blow the whistle. The whistle is still in their hands. So what is, what is the one takeaway that you can give all of us here in this room on how better to engage men and boys? I think working with men and boys, and the point was made earlier, has to start with boys. Because how are we socializing boys to assume a whole range of privileges? We are talking about empowerment, but empowerment alone is not enough. We need to talk about what happens if one group is empowered and the other group is not giving space. Is gender going to be about war in the homes? Is gender going to be, you know, sons and daughters, brothers and sisters can fight, fight. Husbands and wives are also fighting. So are we going to look at women now fighting and toppling men over at the home? No, gender equality is about equality, is about coexistence. So with you know, we are talking empowerment, we have to talk to men about empathy, and together, men, women, all other genders, we have to talk about solidarity. Without these three, we are not really going anywhere. Thank you. Um, I apologize to our panelists, we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Unfortunately, uh, we, we, we're out of time, uh, but it was excellent to at least get some of your perspective uh, in, into this conversation. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to introduce now our final speaker, who really spearheaded the Spotlight Initiative and continues to champion this initiative and gender equality across the globe, EU Commissioner for International Cooperation and Development, Mr. Nevin Mimitsa.
Well, Excellencies, dear Amina, dear Punzile, dear friends, it remains my very great pleasure to thank our distinguished speakers, our dear performers, and to declare the 2018 European Development Days. This year, these are not EDDs, these are SHEDDs. So I declare them officially open. Some of you may remember that when I started this role, I promised to be the most vocal female, uh, male feminist in the European Commission. So today, I'm truly honored and humbled to welcome you to the celebration of women and girls in sustainable development. Little did we know then on the challenges ahead of the attempts to row back on hard-won rights and steps towards true equality. But there is no strength without struggle, and the path of progress rarely runs smooth. Women and men around the world have found the courage to call times up. Now, as a global family, we must have the courage to answer their call, to channel this energy into positive change, and to turn the darkness into light. You just heard how the European Union is joining hands with the United Nations to end gender-based violence once and for all, and to ensure that all women and girls can really shine. Young women like Jaha, who has spoken the unspeakable, found strength in her own struggle, and is now helping to transform the lives of hundreds or thousands of young men and girls like her. Her story shows us that empowering women is not a zero-sum game. It's a win-win for everyone. Because, like a butterfly, every woman and girl has within her the power of a hurricane. If she can only spread her wings. Every day, in every way, I have the great privilege to see this effect in action. From the brilliant and motivated women who I work with on a daily basis, to the resilient and inspiring women and girls I met throughout my travels. From the heads of global and European institutions, to the heart of governments, from grassroots organizations to the very soul of families and communities, women and girls are leading the change that we need to see in some of the most challenging conditions. And let's also not forget in our conversations the brave men and boys who are helping to kick the cultural norms that are holding all of us back. I cannot wait to hear the many more stories of inspiration and innovation that are under this roof. As always, I am particularly grateful to our 18 incredible young leaders, young women and men from all corners of the globe, united in their commitment to create a better world and to empower young women and girls. You are our conscious our motivation, our inspiration. And I thank you from the bottom of my heart for leading the way. If you haven't already, I also encourage you to check out our Faces to Hearts bloggers who have traveled three continents over the last five months to bring you stories of hope and courage. And finally, let me give special thanks to our 24 She's V ambassadors, journalists and doctors, footballers and singers, grassroots activists to global leaders and Nobel Peace Prize winners. You have already created an unprecedented buzz around this year's event. So now let's create a storm. Let's create it online where the CSV and EDD18 hashtags in the Global Village and the Youth Lounge, through cinema and song and dance and food, because when she is empowered, we all prosper. Thank you very much and welcome you all on this CDDs. Thank you.